Welcome to the Naked Podcaster. Get ready to hear the story of someone strong enough to bear it all. The Naked Podcaster is a representation of freeing yourself, giving you permission to be real in all your quirkiness, baggage, struggles to success, and tragedy to triumph. I'm so excited you're joining the journey. Your past doesn't define you, but it does lead you on a path to today. Let's get naked. Hello and welcome to the Naked Podcaster. This is your host, Jen, and today I'm here with Joshua Schmoody. Joshua, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Awesome. I love pre-gaming for like two minutes with you. That was really fun. And this is quite a story. So your website is mylhp.com. Everything will be in show notes. Jump in. It's Lionheart Publishing. That's what it stands for. Yes. And jump in and tell me who you are and what you're doing, because I love what you're doing as a published author. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it, Jen. Um, well, yes, I'm a published author. I'm the author of Reverse Speech in Theory and Practice. The subtitle is How to Use Your Unconscious Mind to Predict the Outcome of Future Events. Um, I'm also the founder of Lionheart Publishing, and I just started a new podcast with co-host Susan Brinder called The High Life. If, if people want to search for that, they can just type in High Life and Joshua Schmoody or Susan Brinder. There's a couple episodes out, but we got a lot of big big stuff coming uh, down the pipe. So they can check that out too. But um, that's, that's pretty much what I do. I'm an author. I'm a publisher. I also give lectures and um, I have a podcast now. So that pretty much sums up what I'm doing. <laughs> Is that all? I mean, <laughs> so tell me what your podcast is about. What's and are do you have um, people that you interview? Yes. Well, it's it's um it's a little bit of both. The first two episodes are, are me and Susan. Susan's kind of interviewing me about publishing. Uh, so some of this is is going to be about publishing. Really, how to start with nothing and get something done because there's a lot of, you know, when I look online, I'm a publishing course junkie. As much as I can learn about publishing, I'm going to learn because I'm in that business. So I want to know the industry, you know, completely, um, <clears throat> the different avenues to make money and, and all that. And I've noticed a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of scams online with people, you know, saying I've got the magic formula, just pay me 2,500 bucks and I'll give you the formula, the secret pill that's going to make you be enormously successful. And, you know, I can tell you from somebody who's been in the industry for five years, there is no magic pill. Um, there is no secret solution. Now there's different strategies. Some might work better than others. I don't think there's a one size fits all approach. You definitely have to work with, with what you're writing about as well. But um, I can tell you that really the success is not going to come unless you actually continue to water and, and nurture the plant that you've, you know, that seed that you've planted. If you just expect to put a book out there and have a lot of people buy your book overnight, that's really not how, how the industry works. Um, so I, I've really, um, I want to kind of help people starting with nothing, give them enough information where they can make something happen on their own uh, without having to pay a lot of money and without, you know, selling them a dream. So <clears throat> some of the podcast episodes are about that. The rest are going to be guests that Susan Brinder is setting up. I handle the the uh, production and the distribution, and she's handling, you know, the guests. So we've got some some really, really cool guests. I mean, the former vice president of Disney. We've got um, one of the heads of the International Space Station. I mean, it's just some crazy stuff coming down the pipes. But I think the main focus of the show is to um, help people live their best life now. Basically, with knowledge, I think – is power and you can live the life you want to live if you just know how the world works and the proper channels to go through to get whatever dream you have to turn that into a reality. You know, I don't think that your situation should define you. I think that regardless of your upbringing, regardless of where you come from, if you if you're equipped with the knowledge and the tools, you can make things happen. I love it because I'm a published author and I self publish and I remember going through the process and if you've never done it, you don't know what you're doing. Right? <laughs> right. And I was like, okay, so now there's an ISBN and now you have to format and now there's library of Congress. And now like, I was like, how many next things are there going to be? Right. And I wasn't necessarily irritated or frustrated. One thing I have to say is if I had uh, known everything ahead of time, I probably wouldn't have started because it would have seen over overwhelming. <laughs> Right? Because yes. I was like, one more thing. Like, how many one more things are there? But on right. the flip side, if I had been prepared better, it wouldn't have been so overwhelming. So I just contradicted right. myself. And I, when I published the book, I was like, oh my God, now I know why 85% of the population who wants to publish doesn't. Right. And I was so passionate about helping people. 
which is right. why you turned into a business and I did it. Um, although you, you've taken it in a completely different direction. I wanted to help them with their storyline. And all oh, right. So ghostwriting like, or, or well, plot, plot development. Yeah. Kind of like book coaching. Right. So right. you still need an editor. I can proofread, but because I just wanted them to get from um, inception or thought to that book being written in a Microsoft Word document, right, where right. is what that's when you take over. So I really wanted to coach people. I was it was such, it's you know I don't know if you have kids, but it's like having a baby. It is. <laughs> I think of my book as my child. <laughs> oh my god! I and do. I have kids, so I'm not minimized. It's like it's not an exaggeration. Right. And I I just wanted people to have that feeling. But you're right. right. So. I'm going to throw something out there and you can tell me what you think. I hate the thought of trying to be prom queen. I was never prom queen, right? right? right. It's like right. a popularity contest. Yes. And yet, if I say I wrote this book to make a difference to someone and no one reads it, I'm not making a difference. So you're right. always battling with like being prom queen and doing nothing and staying true to who you are. And it's really right. tough. And if yes. someone had helped me like with a system, like Jen, here's your, here's who you are and your personality and what you want to accomplish. This would be a good system for you to get the word out more. Right. Right. I, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's uh, right. And you know, one thing, uh, and I'm learning as I go too. I mean, I've learned yeah. a lot, but I'm still, I learn every day. I learn something new, you know, never try to stop learning. But um, one thing that I've noticed as well is when you're an author, <clears throat> especially a nonfiction author, what you really want to do is not just publish your book, but establish yourself as an expert in whatever field you're publishing in. Um, because, you know, money will come from sales, but money will also come from speaking engagements. It will come from lectures. It can come from a whole lot of other things besides the book. So I think as, as an author, especially as a nonfiction author, what authors should really realize is that you can turn one book into literally thousands of different revenue streams. It doesn't have to just be one book, you know, and one language. And that's really what I focused on is <clears throat> taking that and, and turning it into a whole plethora of things that, you know, just different passive income streams. Because from my experience, the more passive income streams you have, the better off you're going to be. Don't expect to make a full-time living off of one or two passive income streams, have a hundred, have 200, because then not only are you not defined by a particular industry, but also you're going to make money regardless of, you know, whether you market it or not, especially if you're doing it in, in different fields, like publishing, reverse speech, Carl Jung. So I'm not just putting all my eggs in one basket. And that's what I what, that would be my advice to most upcoming authors is, yes, focus on your books, but also focus on how you can turn that book into something else, you know, how you can establish yourself as an expert in a particular field. Uh, if you're a, a fiction author, then really look at setting up speaking engagements at your local library before you start book signings, because I'm seeing some of these sites talk about start your book signing now. Well, look, if nobody knows who you are, <laughs> then nobody's going to come to your book signing, dude. You know? Then you're me. And your running team will show up. Yeah. And then, like, right. You know what I'm saying? So you have to start setting up lectures at these libraries. Talk about publishing. Talk about your experiences, your life. Give right, an inspirational right. story. Then write your own press release. The media doesn't come to you. You have to go to them. You know what, what? I'm saying? It's another thing. You know, Fox 26 <laughs> News is not going to come in there and, hey, how, how are many you? one more things are there? <laughs> right. So, I mean, yeah. you have to really establish yourself first. You have to lay a foundation. And then – all that other stuff will come, you know, but that's how you start gaining notoriety. I mean, you have to get out there and do things and, 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 you know, some type of service to others, some type of inspirational story, you know, you have to really, it's like setting up a media event, you know, um, I read Edward Bernays when I was in my early twenties, his book propaganda. And it was really, anybody who doesn't know public relations should read that book because it's a really short book. It's not long. It's not really a hard read, but you can get the mentality of somebody in the media when you read that book. And this is the mentality still today. It's about setting up a media event, you know, a, a press event. So in order to do that, you need to, you need to structure it in such a way that will be appealing for newspapers at least local newspapers to pick up the story. So, you know, for example, author um, uh, inspires uh, underprivileged inner city youth to write a book and, and you know what I'm saying, do something uh, productive with their life or, you know, helps reduce crime by teaching younger inner city youth, you know, the, the joys of self-publishing. Something that will be a headline that'll be catchy enough 
for these media outlets to pick up and run it. And, um, you know, you can get in the news. It's just you have to understand this is where that knowledge comes in that we we're talking about. And that's really what I want to do is I want to equip people with all that knowledge. And it's, it's hard to do in a 30 minute conversation or in a 20 minute conversation, you know, I can just give you bits and pieces, but for authors that are new in the industry, my self publishing, I have a lecture of five hour, two lectures, a five hour one and a two hour one. It's called Book Distribution, Expanded Distribution and Book Distribution 101. They're both on Udemy. They're both free right now. Uh, the five-hour lecture will be paid eventually again, but I'm, I'm running it for free for the next month. So I would recommend that they go to Udemy.com, just type in Expanded Distribution, and it'll be one of the first to come up. And uh, check that out because it's five hours of solid information. I don't I don't like giving a lot of fluff. You know, I don't put a lot of fluff right. in my courses. I try and give you real-world knowledge that you can use and whether you have a lot of money or whether you don't have a lot of money, you can take advantage of these things. I think there's two parts to book writing. Correct me if you think I'm off base. One is actually writing the book and two is all the other stuff you have to do <laughs> if you want your book. You know what I mean? Right. And right. I was good at writing the book. Yes. And then that's where you pick up. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, and I love yeah. that. Well, in my first, uh, it's publishing podcast one one. But if they just type in High Life Joshua Schmoody or High Life Susan Brender right. in Google, it's it's available on all platforms. But my first episode, there's two now. But the first one, I, I get into the four things that every author, every would be author, needs to know when they're publishing their book. I really break down publishing as four things. One is going to be your graphics design for your covers. You know, you have to either pay for it or use a free software like Canva.com yeah. and make your own cover. You have to have a JPEG cover. Um, two is is going to be your editing and your formatting, right? So you want to make sure that your manuscript is formatted properly for the distributors and you want to make sure it's proofread and edited, right? Um, three is going to be your distribution. Distribution is how you get your book into different retailers all over the world. So you want to make sure it's distributed properly. And then the fourth and last is going to be your marketing or your public relations aspect of your books. And that, you know, from my experience, I handle all four of those things. But mm -hmm. the way I've set up my publishing company is um, as an as a per service basis, because I think the, the publishing industry is going to move to catering to more self published authors, yeah. eventually. Um, and from my experience with traditional publishers, unless they're a, a very big, well known publisher, they don't really handle the PR aspect aspect of your books. They typically are only going to handle the, the editing and the distribution aspect from my experience. Now, some of them do, some of the bigger ones, but most of the publishers that I've seen do not handle that. And they still want to take your royalties, which is just crazy to me. So they're handling really something that you can handle yourself very easily. And they're taking like 40, 50% of your royalty share, which I, I just think that's a waste, um, yeah. you know, where you can just start your own publishing company and, and do it yourself. Because either way, you're going to be handling the PR aspect pretty much on your own. I love that you handle all four of those. For me, the first go, like I, I have a very good friend and she's my editor. I am so, I so strongly believe in editing and proofreading. I could proofread another book, but I won't proofread read my own. <laughs> it, yeah. It's a different, it's a different animal when it's your own stuff. Um, it is. And you're right. You can do the book cover. I mean, I, I would maybe do that myself and maybe have somebody else do it, but those two, you know, like if I have a couple things that I already have figured out, I would want to pick and choose the things that I don't have figured out. So I, right. I love your platform. Right. Tell me about how to use your unconscious mind to predict the outcome of future events. Okay, yeah. So um, basically, I, I got the concept for that book through what had happened to me back in 2008. Um, I'm from Houston, Texas, and uh, I was traveling from Houston to Corpus for spring break. I was going out to the beach to party, and um, I just smoked some weed. I'm a, I've been a weed smoker for 20 years. I don't really look at it as a horrible thing. But uh, and thankfully, we're starting to come around to that as a country, which I think is is much. I mean, that's that makes me very happy. Um, but anyway, this in 2008 the weed thing was still, you know, it was still, we were still in the reefer madness era, if you will, of the marijuana. And I got pulled over in this small town called Edna um, on the way to Corpus Christi. And in Texas, Texas is full of these really small towns like Tulia, Vider, Edna. And I mean, this, these are towns where racism really still lives, where, you know, your deep South sort of mentality, right? Um, cowboy hats, dip in the mouth, yeehaw, do -si do type stuff. And um, the bigger cities are more progressive, but these smaller towns are 
they're clinging on to that past, you know, like anything that can distort that is the enemy, right? Um, so they, they don't want change in these smaller towns. And anyway, I got pulled over in this town and and um, these cops, you know, I had smelt like weed, but I didn't have anything on me. So these cops search me four times and search my passenger, proceed to arrest me. And I'm like, why are you arresting me when there's no, you have no marijuana, but they're arresting me for possession of marijuana. And I didn't know where I was at at the time. Had I known that I was in a town notorious for this type of stuff, like they've been in the, the newspaper, anybody who wants to learn more about Edna can read a 12 page expose on the Austin Chronicle. Um, it's titled Crackpot Crackdown. If they just Google Crackpot Crackdown, they'll come up with a 12 page article that gets all into Edna and into Bobby Bell, the district attorney there. But um, anyway, I, I didn't know I was in Belltown, if you will. And so the cops arrest me and take me to jail. And um, I'm in my early 20s at the time. Had, had I known where I was at, I would have taken that possession charge and just got the hell out of there, man. Um, but I, I told the judge I was going to retain my own attorney when I got bonded out. So I got bonded out, and two weeks later, because I'm retaining my attorney, mind you, and they're going to lose if we go for possession because they have no physical evidence, um, they turn around and indict me for a third-degree felony for tampering with physical evidence, which is a much more serious crime. It's a two to ten years. Um, so I'm, like, flabbergasted that this is even happening, and uh, I end up taking it to trial because the DA wanted to plea me to seven years. And I'm like, I have no adult record. I have no felonies. I mean, I'm not, I do not have an extensive criminal history. I mean, it's all petty, you know, just stupid stuff, no, no major stuff. And um, anyway, he wanted to plead me to seven years. I'm like, you're trying to plead me to 70% of what the – that's insane. You know, if you were to come at me with some reasonable like two, I probably would have just taken the plea. You know what I'm saying? But seven years, I'm not a second-time felon. I'm not a – you know what I'm saying? There's no reason for you to come at me with 70%. And um, – of course, he tells people he comes at, at people with 40%, but that's a load of crap. Uh, that's what he says in that article, the Austin Chronicle. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he, I took it to trial, and uh, I got my trial in 2012, which was another joke. Um, it was a situation where the state could subpoena every witness they want, and any of the witnesses we subpoenaed denied, or they didn't make an explicit ruling because they knew they were in the wrong, so they just kind of like – Hush hushed it and didn't, you know what I'm saying? Just didn't even act on on the motion. So yeah, there was a lot of that going on too. But anyway, I got this, whatever you want to call it. I wouldn't call it a trial, but I got this trial and I ended up losing at the trial, which is a foregone conclusion. I have no defense witnesses. They've got five witnesses against me. I, there's nothing. I might as well just remain silent and just let you rape me, basically, uh, figuratively speaking. And so that's pretty much what happened. And uh, they gave me 10 years and I ended up doing two years in prison for this charge. So um, it really changed my life. But before this incident happened, January of 2008, because this happened in May of 2008, I was um, in reverse speech. I was taking the training for reverse speech, and David Oates was my my teacher at that time. And uh, I was doing a session on myself, asking myself where I see myself in three to six months, and, and recording it and doing an analysis on it in reverse. And one of the reversals I got was summer of shame, let's miss it. I was like, summer of shame, let's miss it. Well, sure enough, in May of that year, the summer of that year, this is when all of this happened and my life got flipped upside down. It was a sh summer of shame. Um, and that happening gave me the idea for the book, you know, because if it could predict the future of, of something like that happening, could it predict the future if we used it in a controlled setting and more of a scientific investigator, you know, type way. So anybody could replicate the experiment. And that's, uh, that's what I did with the book. I put forth a hypothesis and tested it and came to a conclusion. So um, the book is written in a way that's not like, believe what I tell you, or, you know, I'm the cult leader, believe what I say and don't question. It's more like, here's my hypothesis. This is my research. These are my findings. You test it yourself and come to your own conclusions. Um, and uh, it, it, really changed my life. It opened up a lot of new doors for me that I didn't know were, were there. And it uh, really caused me to start thinking outside the box. So that's kind of how the book came to be. Now, what reverse speech is, is a whole different, right? Just to give people an understanding of what it is. Um, reverse speech theory is um, a set of theories that was developed by an Australian researcher named David John Oates. Back in 1987, he published his first book called um, Beyond Backward Masking. And what it was is back in the 70s and 80s, a lot of <clears throat> preachers were playing records backwards. 
like Liz oh my Zeppelin. gosh yes okay right stairway okay. to heaven and getting yeah. messages right and saying it was from the devil and, and all this well um david oates discovered that this wasn't just in music that this phenomenon was happening in everyday communication and if we were to record ourselves and play it backwards we would get messages every 15 to 30 seconds which come from our unconscious mind and actually complement what we're saying forward so if i'm talking about God forwards, then we'll get messages about God in reverse. If I'm talking about where I see myself in three months uh, and we play it backwards, I will get reversals about where I will be in three months. So that's really a basic kind of breakdown of reverse speech. And um, I was a student from 2007 to 2009. I got my um, reverse speech analyst certificate. And that has kind of been my my starting point for, for future research into this. But um, that's basically what reverse speech theory is. It's, a, it's a, another form of communication that comes from our unconscious mind when we're speaking. Um, and it's not generated by the words that we use, but the sound, the tonality that we use when we say them. So me and you, Jen, could say the exact same thing forwards and get totally different backward messages depending on the emotion that we use when we said the words. I want to make sure I understand you record yourself saying something about what your projection of where you are in the future or whatever your whatever, whatever you, you want, want information information right. on and then you play that recording backwards right exactly you play wow. it backwards any sound editing software I use reverse speech pro but for people that don't you know want to drop the hundred bucks for the sound editing software they can get the reverse speech app on their phone for free or they can use a sound editing software called audacity oh, uh, yeah. and I believe it's audacity.org but that's a free sound editing software for Windows um, that anybody can get and all you really need to do is just load your audio into the sound editing software and start playing it backwards at about 85% speed and that's how you find reversals basically in a nutshell. Holy cow, that is so fascinating because I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't completely connect that. That is fascinating. So I can I understand why you take this class and you're super fascinated by it. First right, of all, right. like just in general, I was born in 1970. So I remember all the records being played backwards in the Satan and the, <laughs> <laughs> right. and I never did it. I was like, there's some things I don't want to hear. So, <laughs> but I remember that, that was, that's, so that's really fascinating. And then for this experience to have happened. So can you tell me more about what did you say and what were you doing in that class that made it the summer of shame, let's miss it. Cause wow, that's like a slap in the face, you know? Right. Well, the way David, um, the way he sets up his classes is not uh, believe what I say type type way. The way his classes are set up is here's my theories. Now here's your homework. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to play some music backwards and find 10 messages and send it to me. I want you to record a session of yourself and talk about, you know, lie intentionally and then record it in reverse and see if it corrects the lie. I mean, it's homework assignments like this that he, he gives you where you're really proving this to yourself as you're learning. And I remember the first like aha experience that I got uh, when I was doing my investigator certificate is I had lost my keys, my car keys, and I was, I was, I didn't know where I put them. So I recorded a session on myself, you know, with the theory of complementarity, whatever I want information on, I just talk about, and I'll get it. So I recorded a session asking myself where I had the keys last, you know, just kind of backtracking. Um, and one of the reversals I got was the nails looking at it. I was like, the nails looking at it, what? And I ended up walking into a walk-in closet I had at the time, and I had a ledge, like a little windowsill ledge in the closet on the inside. And I looked at the ledge, and the tip of the nail was pointed directly at my keys. And that's when I was like, wow, you know, because there's always that doubting of, am I just projecting this stuff? Like, is this just a figment of my imagination? Am I going crazy um, but I continuously get reversals like that that give information that I didn't know consciously so I'm just projecting into the gibberish why am I getting accurate information and now after using this technology for over 10 years I mean it's beyond me believing what he says and there's definitely something to what he's saying um, do I think his theories are infallible no I don't I definitely think there's room for improvements but the phenomenon itself there's something happening there that if people just take the time to investigate it themselves they'll they'll probably come to the same conclusions that's crazy and so it's so fascinating anyone who believes i mean we all believe we should believe in our unconscious mind and if right. we could just tap into it more wouldn't it be easier because we squish it down or we don't listen or we don't know how to tap into it or right. whatever we wait to dream you know right right, right. <laughs> yeah 
and yeah, you're, here's a way. Exactly. I mean, we only use 10% of our brains typically consciously. I mean, the rest is 90, it's, it's unconscious out of the 90%. Um, I think we're capable of a lot more than we think we're capable of. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have access to a lot more knowledge than we think we have consciously. It's just below the threshold of, of consciousness. Um, and really the best way to, to describe that would be dreams, which is what I relate in the first chapter of my book. Um, dreams have, have been considered by numerous cultures um, all over the world as a means of communication with the gods, if you will. It's, it's a means of God communicating with men and women is through dreams. And there's, there's numerous Bible verses in the Old Testament, especially that talk about dreams being used by God to, to um, raise up prophets or to, to speak uh, and teach them what they are to learn. I believe the book of Numbers, there's one I know in the book of Job. Um, so there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of examples in the Bible that relate dreams as something uh, some type of means of communication with a higher intelligence, right? Whether you think it's God or your higher self or, or whatever, you know, um, I, I haven't, I don't really like to put it in that religious garb because then it, it um, you know, it becomes like one culture over another. I really see the unconscious as a universal means of communication with that divine aspect um, that anybody has access to, regardless of what you believe or what your faith is. We all have this, this element within us that's, you know, it's like a greater personality, as Jung called it, um, something that is not of our ego, but something that sort of transcends the limitations of, of our ego. So, yeah, um, if they think like that, we've all had dreams that have predicted the future. Um, I know I've had many that have come true. And most people I talk to will say, oh, yes, I've had a dream and it really happened. Uh, I think this is something that we all inherently have. It's just it typically only expresses itself when we're in the most danger. Um, Socrates, uh, before he died, and I believe it was in the Phaedo, he tells the judges, he says, oh, now men – you who condemn me says I'm about to die, and in the hour of my death, or in the mount, in the hour of our death, men are gifted with prophetic power. Uh, so it sort of hints at this like um, self defense mechanism, right, in our unconscious that will express itself when we are in the most danger consciously. Um, Abraham Lincoln is a really good historical example of that happening. Um, two weeks before he he died, he got assassinated. He had a dream that he was wandering through the White House, and he heard these sobs and these these cries. And he walked into the East Room, and there was his, you know, his coffin with soldiers stationed around the coffin and this throng of people. And he went up to one of the soldiers, and he said, who's dead in the White House? And the soldier said, the president. He was shot by an assassin. Uh, and then a loud burst of grief woke him from his dream. So, and two weeks later, he was shot and killed. So that was a... That was a, a very hands-on, direct way of his unconscious mind telling him, listen, you need to be careful. You are going to be assassinated. And there was no figurative language that it was using. I mean, that was a pretty rare occurrence where your yeah. dreams were being literal. You know, they were telling you literally what's going to happen. So I think that um, reverse speech being that it comes from that same part of the mind has the same capabilities. So that's, that's really how people can kind of familiarize themselves with what reverse speech is. Just compare it to your dreams because they're both coming from the same area of the mind. I love this. This is so exciting. Let's take a look at, so now you're here you are, you have this reverse speech experience and then a couple months later you get pulled over. Right. Right. Completely different journey. How long did it take you to put together and how much of the reverse speech did you use during the process? Um, a, a lot. Um, basically, the I already had the concept of using reverse speech to predict the future. I just didn't have the hypothesis, a way to structure it that could be replicated by other people. Um, and the hypothesis came to me, actually, um, believe it or not, when I was uh, – Typically, I will use um, psychedelics, but not all the time. I use them maybe one or once or twice a year, uh, and it's for specific purposes. Um, if you if you use psychedelics like mushrooms in that way, they can actually be a very powerful tool for transformation. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of people that just use them to party, and if that's what they do, that's what they do. But it it has a much more spiritual use than that, especially if it's directed. You know, if you're meditating on this and you know you're fasting and you're treating it really like a vision quest, you know, and then you you ingest this with a sole purpose, you know, with a, an intent already in mind. Um, you can get things that normally consciously 
I don't think you would you would dream up, right? Um, because I guess they put you in such a state where you're able to see things in a different way. Um, and that's important because if you're always looking at something from the same angle, you're always going to see the same thing. But if you can look at it from different angles, you can see things that otherwise you didn't see before. So that's how I got the hypothesis originally was, um, and this is the hypothesis that I put in the book, um, when discussing the outcome of future events, using your kinesthetic sensory function or talking about what you feel is more likely to generate future tense reversals. And these are reversals that predict the outcome of a future event. It's a, it's a certain category of reversals, according to David, um, than using the visual or auditory sensory functions and talking about what you see or what you hear. So what I did is I used 14 questions. Seven of them were using the feeling, um, you know, what do you feel is going to be the winning horse. Why do you feel this way? What feelings do you get when you think of horse number one and your, you know, in your mind? Uh, how would you feel if this horse lost? How would you feel if this horse won? Uh, and then seven questions using the visual and the auditory sensory function. So what do you see looking into the future in your mind's eye? when I, I talk about horse number, blah, 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 blah. Um, what would you, uh, what do you see in, in regards to horse number, blah, 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 crossing the finish line? What would, what would you say if you saw horse number one didn't? What would you say if you saw horse number one did? Uh, and then what have you heard about this horse? So I'm using those sensory modalities, right, to um, direct the way the conversation is, is, is shaped. Um, and, you know, what I did is I asked myself and three other subjects those same 14 questions each, all talking about the same race, and documented the findings after I did an analysis three days before the race. And uh, what I found uh, typically is that regardless of who it is and regardless of how much you know about the race, it doesn't matter. Um, your unconscious will, if it is untruthful, if what you're saying is untruthful, your unconscious mind will correct the lie. If what you're saying is truthful, your unconscious mind will expand upon it. So basically, and this is something that's been well known in reverse speech, um, when somebody is lying forwards, their reversals will correct the lie. Um, they will basically let the analyst know this person is lying consciously. Um, I remember one on David, which is, is classic. Uh, he was looking for a publisher for his first book, and uh, the publisher was talking about selling the rights to the book forward. He's like, then we can sell the rights to the book. And uh, he played it backwards, and he said, I'm so full of shit. <laughs> I'm so full of shit. <laughs> so the thing about reverse speech is like the way to just cut past all the BS, you know, cut past the fakeness, cut past the mask that they're showing you and get down to the what this person is really all about. And uh, it's a powerful experience for people because it doesn't tell you what you want to hear. It's not going to flatter you and tell you, you know, oh, you're doing so great. Just keep it up. And you're really not. I mean, it's going to put it out there. I remember I got reversals when I was doing the book, like my life is an arsenic, which it really was an arsenic at that time. Arsenic is a metaphor for like poison. Like you're there's right, a lot right, of right. stuff happening because of all this stuff. The case, I was losing my home. I was, I mean, everything. It's like everything just went to kaput, right? Right. Um, so, you know, there's your reversals will not flatter you and they will not tell you a rosy picture if it's not a rosy picture. But if you are brave enough to take a serious look at yourself like that and open minded enough to be critical of yourself and not think that you know all the answers or that you know you're doing the right thing it doesn't matter what what other people say if you're able to really think critically about yourself and, and analyze yourself then it can actually give you um, the answers to to questions in your life not just about the future I mean the future is one but it can really give you um, advice on how to organize and structure your life and and what you should be doing and, and what to focus your attention on and really ultimately what your destiny is so it ties into to, to Jung psychology as well, because Jung understood that our dreams are not just a retrospective, um, a retrospective reservoir of memories and repressed sexual fantasies, as Freud thought of them, but that our dreams have a prospective element that they can predict the future of the individual. Um, and typically, if, if one focuses on their dreams and begins to keep a journal of consecutive dreams, Jung believed that they all circumambulate or revolve around a center of meaning, a nucleus of meaning. And um, once this is uncovered by the conscious mind, um, it will begin to produce what's called mandala symbols or mandala dreams. And these uh, relay the image of the self, as Jung called it, which is, uh, it's an unconscious image that represents our entire destiny condensed into, you know, a, a string of images, a single image. But um, 
this inner experience is really the heart of, of Jung's analytical psychology. And I think it's the heart of reverse speech theory as well. It's, it's about um, using your unconscious mind to uncover what your blueprint is, the reason you are here, because I believe we all have that. Um, and so using tools like this, people can understand what that destiny is. And, and don't confuse what I mean by destiny with career path. Although they can be coupled together, a lot of people will identify themselves with their career. You know, like, who am I? Oh, I'm a teacher. No, you work as a teacher. But I mean, who are you really, you know, as a person, not just a teacher. So people need to start looking at, at destiny as more than just a career path in life, as something that is, is bigger than themselves and something that um, has a, a deeper spiritual meaning than just choosing a career path and making a lot of money. Okay, that was one of my questions because it's easy to get those crossed when you're saying, you know, what am I supposed to do or who am I supposed to be? Right. It's, it's We are very tied up with career, so it's actually kind of probably hard for a lot of people to make that segregation. Right. The other thing I want to know is, is it ever scary or people – because you're saying, oh, anybody can do this and ask. And I'm like, I am on it. We're going to get done with this podcast. I'm going to download your book. I'm going to ask myself these questions. I'm going to record it. I've got the, like, I'm ready to go. And then I'm like, but maybe tomorrow. <laughs> I, is it frightening for people? And when you say, I, well, I love that you say, you know, there's nothing flowery about the subconscious. If it says your life is arsenic, that's it. <laughs> right. Is it's it ever, can, yeah, like, you're, <laughs> you need to get out of the shit. But right. Is exactly. it ever um, presented in a way that feels like a riddle? Yes, many times, many times. So the unconscious mind, um, it uses metaphors to describe, just like our dreams typically. Sometimes we'll get dreams that are literal, like Abraham Lincoln's dream. Other times we'll get dreams that are figurative. Most of the times we get them figurative and metaphoric and symbolic, right? Um, so just like dreams, reversals use metaphors to describe um, higher concepts and ideals. So, for example, um, if somebody has lost motivation in their life uh, and you were to do a session on them and record it, they would get reversals like, my wolf is sick or my wolf has fallen in the lake. Wolf is a common collective metaphor for motivation. So if somebody's wolf is sick or somebody's wolf has fallen in the lake, that means forwards consciously their behavior is they've lost motivation in life. Um, another instance would be if a person has lost hope. If a person has lost hope, they'll get reversals like my goddess is slain or my goddess is sick. Um, goddess is a universal metaphor, at least in the Western hemisphere, uh, that we all use collectively to describe hope. So if your goddess is slain or if your goddess is sick, then that means you've lost hope in life. Um, and with David's technique of metaphor restructuring, which is a really the heart of reverse speech theory. It's, it's much more than just playing stuff backwards. What David devised is a way to shift the unconscious metaphor. So if I am running metaphors like my wolf is sick or my goddess is slain, with metaphor restructuring, we can actually shift those metaphors and make your wolf better again or heal your goddess. And when, when that is done, consciously the behavior of the person changes, but it's done at an unconscious level. So the changes that happen behaviorally, the person doesn't recognize them until after the change has already happened which is pretty cool i mean you'll you won't even know that you've made the change consciously you'll just you wake up one day and say oh wait a minute that changed <laughs> i mean it's happened to me before so it's like you know having it happen it takes about six to eight weeks but you'll notice that what you were trying to change just changes you don't there is no effort it's just bam it just changes so it's a really powerful tool um a psychotherapeutic tool for people and i think that it's going to revolutionize um, analytical psychology in particular, but I think um, psychology in general, uh, once it becomes more accepted in the academic community. I hope so. I hope it's more accepted in the academic com community. And I'm not bashing traditional therapy because I've done it and it's right. worked to some degree, right. but it, it's not the modality that I would ever, that would not be my first choice ever. It's down the list somewhere. Right. I don't think consciously talking about the crap that's really pissing you off is the issue. Right, and right. That, that's a reason that I don't think it works. Well, and that's uh, – it's, it's interesting you say that because with most traditional therapy, it, it, it regardless of what the therapist asked or asked the patient, um, the patient can respond and just, just give you a bunch of BS. Yeah. So um, it could take years for the patient to trust the therapist enough to really tell them – 
the deeper issues that they, they keep bottled up inside, which I think is where you need to go in therapy if you're trying to get anywhere. That as well as being real with yourself. Um, there's a certain way that we will, um, I guess, nominalize our problems. We, we will um, say it's better than it actually is to make ourselves feel better, I guess. And we all do this, you know what I'm saying, to a certain extent. It's hard to look yourself in, in the face and admit the truth sometimes to yourself. It's definitely hard. Um, and it takes real courage to be able to do that. So with reverse speech, what's great about it is that it can cut past all the BS, just like with that publisher, you know, telling you, oh, we're going to sell the rights, you're going to make all this money, blah, blah, blah. And you play it backwards, I'm so full of shit. So it, it can cut past all the BS, right, very quickly uh, in a therapeutic situation and get to things that the patient might not even want that therapist knowing right now, um, you know, psychological issues, behavioral issues. But also it can hit on things that even the patient themselves doesn't want to admit to themselves consciously. And that's what makes it such a powerful tool. With energy work, what I've found is that it isn't even that I don't, like I'm there, I want to work on things. You want to get past something. I don't right. even know how to connect with what the real issue is because it's subconscious. Right. So you're just telling me this is another way to quickly and easily that you can do on your own, cut through the BS and get to the real issue that's unconscious. Because I mean, I, I have worked with people where I'm like, oh my God, that's the issue? Like really? <laughs> I would have never guessed that in a million years. So right. like, let's resolve that because because they move right. on. Right. So right. this this is another so I completely I completely get it. How many people are resistant to really knowing? Well, that would show up in the lie first. Uh, well, yes. And what's this is a phenomenon David calls reversal um, reaction. So what will happen if things come up during the session that are embarrassing, at least in reverse, you know, the patient hit on some things, but they get reversals that are, are telling a whole different story, right? Whether the reversals that are correcting the patient's lies or the reversals that are, are hitting on a very uh, touchy subject for them that they don't want to discuss and they tried not to discuss forwards is just coming up. When these sort of reversals happen and they're revealed by the analyst to the patient, they will go into a reversal reaction mode where they blame the analyst. Wow. Like, oh, it's you. You're just making this up, blah, blah, blah. Because it's so – it's embarrassing, especially if you were lying the whole time and BSing the therapist and you're getting reversals like, I'm so full of shit. I'm a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's very hard for people to you know, sit there and say, oh, you know what? I'm a liar. You're right. I'm a piece of shit. You know? I shouldn't have lied. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, That's not true. Totally. Right. So Nailed people, it. <laughs> people will say, it's your fault. You're making this up. But you're the liar. And uh, this is a pretty normal occurrence in reverse speech. So, yes, it does happen. Um, and I, what David recommends when people are first learning this is um, not to do any reversals on yourself for the first three to six months, but to just focus on doing reversals on music or on speeches from other people to kind of give you um, uh, a, an idea of the actual sounds of reversals. So, how analysts will notice a reversal is there is with gibberish, you'll just hear a monotone sound like bah, 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 when you're playing it backwards. Well, with reversals, there's a definite beat, tempo, and, and tone, right? So when there's a reversal there, you'll hear a blah, blah, and then so it'll you know you'll hear a definite tonality it's it's a definite sound change where it's just after 10 years it comes like that you know it's like tuning your ears to a musical instrument um so when you're first doing it on yourself i recommend not to or when you're first learning i recommend not to do it on yourself um just do it on on music. Uh, music is the, the easiest way to learn because mm -hmm. because of the the high emotional state that the artist is in when they're singing, reversals are much more likely to occur uh, more frequently. So with David, what what he's theorized is that our reversals occur when there's high exchanges of rapport. So when we're having a really good conversation and we're both just, wow, yeah, you know, kind of like what we're doing now and play this backwards, we will get more reversals than if I was reading a script. You know what I'm saying? If I'm just reading yes. a script, speaking into a camera. So keep that in mind too. But music is probably the best way to, to get an idea of, of reversals and to really hear them very clearly. Uh, and then after that, I would recommend maybe doing it um, not on anybody close to you, but just some past speeches or, uh, you know, past lectures by other people. Uh, do it on that first. And then once you get a feel for it, start doing it on yourself. But be prepared to to hear things that you don't, you know, you don't probably want to hear sometimes. Uh, and I've also gotten reversals very strangely. But when I was in the process of developing this book, um, I, I, 
when this was happening, I didn't realize what was really happening at the time. And what was really happening was the death of an old life and the birth of a new life, right? And these are, we all go through this in our life, however drastic. We all are going through these cycles, these, these cycles of change, right? Our first cycle of change is from young childhood into adolescence. These are definite cycles. There's the death of an old life and the birth of a new life, a whole new way of thinking, new way of living. You know, you're not attached to mother or father anymore. You're not dependent. At least you feel you're not dependent on mother and father anymore. You know, as in adolescence, they begin to get that independent, I want to do what I want to do. Um, so there's that change of life. And then there's another change of life from adolescence into young adulthood. This is when you're out of high school. This is when you're getting into college and you're really deciding what is my career path in life? What am I going to do? Uh, and then finally, you have the final phase of life, which is where you go from that early young adulthood phase into your later life until you become middle aged, um, you know, and really begin to reflect back on your life and what you've done and what your accomplishments are. So we go through these, these transitions in our life unconsciously for most people but the f the the whole um approach that that jung takes as well as david is is psychologically to consciously understand that these processes are happening and try to sort of work with those processes so what was really happening was the death of an old life and the beginning of a new life when i was going through this and, and writing this book and one of the reversals i got was on a roommate, that same roommate who got pulled over with me uh, and ended up testifying against me at the trial, which was a joke in and of itself. But anyway, um, he, I was doing a session on him, and uh, this is before he moved out. We were still living together, and this case had just started happening. And one of the reversals was – because he couldn't find a job. He didn't have a job for three months. And I was helping this dude. And I finally said, look, I'm not your mother, dude. I mean, I'll be your friend, but friends don't take advantage of friends like this and just live off of me. You know what I'm saying? I have no problem helping you. But if you're not even actively looking for a job, you got to go. I mean, you got to go because <laughs> I don't need you here to eat all my food and, and mooch off of me. So anyway, we were doing a session on why he hasn't found a job, why he was lacking motivation. And one of the reversals that I got when we're talking about what he should be doing in the future, what I should be doing, was it's an act of the divine. And it's, it's very strange because you rarely get reversals like that. I mean, especially if you're not talking about God. But it, you'll get reversals sometimes that will literally tell you things that are very spiritual. Um, you know, it's an act of the divine. Like the reason this is happening, there's a, a divine agency at work, basically. So there's also that aspect of reverse speech. I mean, at its deepest levels, it deals with the state and condition of the human soul. When people are doing these these sessions on themselves or with other people, they'll notice that it can get very very deep very very quickly. And some people, you know, they don't know how to react to that. So um, just be on the lookout for that because you might get reversals that'll get really really spiritual. And and um, if you're not really a spiritual person, uh, these reversals could probably have a, a a bigger impact on you because it's it's basically it's not asking you to believe or to have faith. It's you know it's telling you in a very scientific way you can do this and this will happen. Um, so just be on the lookout for that because I've gotten reversals throughout my life that refer to some sort of God or divine agency playing a hand in this situation in your life. So what did you think and do when that came? Was that like, what? Right. Well, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it at that time because this was just happening. It was just happening. So I didn't have right. the book written. I didn't have now that the book's been written and I've, you know, I've started all these new ventures and all these things, these doors are opening. Now it makes sense, you know, because had I not done that, had I not gone through that experience, I would not be where I'm at today. And where I'm at today, I would much rather be where I'm at today than where I was at then. Um, you know, because where I was at then was overweight, um, you know, stuck in this whole cycle of bills and working 12 hours a day, five days a week to get by. And that's just, that's not the life I want to live anyway. So now I'm really living a life that I want to live, you know, doing something I want to do. You know, I, I'm not having to go work at a job I hate. I'm doing a job that I love. I'm a teacher. I'm a writer. Uh, and I'm a speaker, lecturer. I mean, these are things that I want to do anyway. So I think that one message people should realize is that in your life, these experiences, these tragedies, don't say all boohoo me and blame God or everybody else for them because they're meant to make you grow. And it's not meant to be mean or to, you know, to make you suffer just to suffer. It's meant to wake you up and, and kind of hit you upside the head and say, hey, 
You know, <laughs> why aren't you doing what you need to be doing? You know, if, if you don't change, life sometimes will force you to change and yeah. will throw a situation at you that you have to change now. There's no more putting it off, putting it on the back burner. Like you need to confront this and you need to confront it right now. So to, to your listeners, always keep that in mind, you know, accept both your, your, your joy and your tragedy equally in life because it's both of these that are needed to make you grow and to help you become who you're supposed to become, right? Absolutely. And I, that's something that I've preached. I mean, it, it's something that happens to your past, your childhood. It doesn't define who you are, but it is exactly. a part of it that you can use to launch. I mean, it's kind of like use this for good or evil with great responsibility. But you know what I mean? It's that whole, right. all of those superhero things, but they're true. Right. They're true. I mean, you have the, you can't stop what happened to you, but you can make sure it doesn't define you and you can use right. it for the greater good right. or evil. So a hundred percent. That's yep. right. Yep. Okay. You go through this four year case and spend two years in prison. I just want to touch on like, that can't be not life changing. Oh yeah, it definitely was life changing. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, there was definitely, I'm not going to lie. There was that year, year and a half when it first started happening where I went through the depression phase, you know, I went through the boohoo pity me, why me phase. Um, and then I just, I got to a point one day where it was like, you know what? I, fuck this. I'm not going to let this define my life. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up. I will not throw in the towel. I refuse to quit. I refuse to do that. Uh, and because then I let Bobby Bell win. Then I let these, you know, that, that asshole, you know, cause he thought this was funny. I mean, he had this huge grin on his face. Like this, this gave this dude his jollies. And I'm just thinking like, you must really hate yourself. Like you must yeah. really hate yourself to get off to the suffering of others. Like, I don't, I don't care how, you know, I, I do not get off to seeing other people suffer. I, I hurt when I see other people hurt. I want to help them. Even if I don't have the means to help them, I will try to help them. I don't like to see people suffer. And I think for somebody who likes to see people suffer, somebody who gets off to that there's something deeper psychologically so this dude was a yeah. real piece of you know piece of work um so i'm not gonna let him win you know just like with getting you know some some woman getting raped in her life right and and holding that and saying i was raped this happened to me and now i'm gonna let it define me now i'm just gonna right. shut down and and let that person win um you know with my mom she her and her dad didn't see eye to eye they had issues growing up right and she kind of let these issues they had these childhood teenage issues define her later life and i love my mom but it's like i saw this because i was looking from the outside in and i saw how she would use those experiences to define her self-worth to define her her confidence in herself and um that was to me that's very sad because now you're just regardless of whether he was a good father bad father whatever he's my grandfather i love him but you cannot let that define you because then that person wins that person still has control of your life you know all you're doing is giving them control you're not yes. doing anything to help yourself and I love that you used rape. That was, I grew up very dysfunctionally. So that was part of my life growing up. And someone asked me once, I'm going to use this as an example. How do you have a normal sexual relationship after going through that? Well, that person isn't allowed in my bedroom. Right, right. End of story. Put a chair right. outside and let exactly. them sit there. If you, yep. if you need a physical representation of that person not being allowed, because that's where they belong. Right. You have to deal with it. You have to process it. You have to figure it out and work it. But you're not figuring it out in the bedroom. You don't right. take a exactly. sexual dysfunction and figure it out in your current sex life. Exactly. End of story. So I, I love this. I, I love this because I think that's totally true. You just gave this person who's not in the room all the control over your life. And how happy yep. would that person be to know that this many years later in a totally still, different situation, right. they're still the puppet master of your yep. life. They're still controlling things behind in the In any scene. situation, right. Yep. So take rape, take sex, take anything you want, and it's the same exact thing. You are giving them, you're allowing them to be the puppet master. Right. So yep. true. So you went through this, you wrote your book, you wrote your book because of this situation you went through and because of the class. And the, I mean, it was you had a lot of, Talk about divine intervention. You had a lot right. directing you on this path. I think so, right. And then you turned it into a publishing business, which I totally see that correlation. Right, right. Because I'm a published author and I know how hard it is. And so I like I really wanted to get passionate and help people. And that's right. exactly what you did. You are helping people also be able to write their book. Exactly. What are you doing in the realm of the reverse speech? 
Um, I am about to start some courses. Right now I have three more lectures that I'm doing on Carl Jung, but um, basically I'm, I'm going to start a whole Udemy lecture series. It's going to be five, ten hours, probably closer to ten, but it's going to actually teach people how to how to use reverse speech and get them a, a certification through the Reverse Speech Association. So what I'm planning right now is to actually have a whole new lecture series specifically on reverse speech that will teach people what it is, how to use it, and then eventually how to use it in the fashion that I've used it. Uh, and then get a certification from the Reverse Speech Association. So that's going to be what I'm going to be doing with Reverse Speech soon. Um, but in terms of using it psychotherapeutically, I have used it with sort of clients that it's more of an underground practice. I'm not doing it above ground right now because I want to perfect my technique. Um, so I don't want to start charging people until I've seen it work with other patients. So I take on people for free, typically people that are struggling with like um, chemical dependency issues uh, and then use metaphor restructuring. And, um, you know, I tell them right off the bat, look, I'm not going to promise you anything. I'm, these are, you know, this is my test. This is how I'm doing my research. So it, you, you could have a really great thing happen. It might be worse. I mean, I, I don't know. So I, I try to not promise them anything off the jump, you know, say, look, we're going to do this. This could happen. This could happen. I don't know. But if you're willing to do it, you know, I will do it for you for free and just use this as my 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 research so eventually i do want to start charging and using it you know in a professional psychotherapeutic sense but right now um it's more of an underground thing uh, and then i do plan on having the udemy lectures coming out by the end of this year beginning of next year uh, that are specifically going to deal with uh, learning reverse speech how exciting even after 10 years and being certified you're still <laughs> are right. you a perfectionist can we play that backwards <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't say perfectionist but i am um, i've always been fascinated yeah. with um the unconscious and dreams and just my own inner experiences have always led me to question i guess the development of personality in general and what makes people think the way they do why do people act the way they do um you know how does personality how is it formed how is it developed I love it. Joshua, thank you so much for being on and sharing your story. It's really incredible. Thank you. I appreciate you having me, Jen. Thank you for taking the time to get naked with us. If you'd like to bear it all with